Now, next we're going to talk about appendicular skeletons, so limbs and girdles. We're going to start with the upper. The girdle braces and supports the limbs. So here you have pictorial girdle. This is the clavicle. Be ready to see, I don't know if I have a disarticulated clavicle, not, not that I see, no. Well, I'm going to say a few words about the clavicle. Oh, yeah, I do. It's kind of mangled a little bit. So, clavicle articulates with the sternum and with the acromial process, the back process, acromial process of the scapula. So, you can tell which end of the clavicle articulates with what. The sternal end is pretty blunt. The acromial end is much more flat. Can you see that? That's all about, it's all about <laughs> clavicle. Now let's move on to scapula. So what I hold in my hand is the right scapula, okay? It has three borders, the lateral or the medial, the lateral and superior border. The back surface, the posterior surface of the scapula is separated by the spine. And you have two fossae, infraspinous, below the spine and supraspinous. Does that make sense? There are muscles there infraspinatus and supraspinatus. The anterior surface, that's right there, is also called a fossa, subscapular fossa. Guess what? There is a muscle here, subscapularis. Okay? Now, these processes here, there are two of them. The posterior process here is called the acromion, and it um, articulates the clavicle, the anterior process is coracoid, and it's the site of origin for many muscles, especially in your anterior arm. Okay? Arm. Again, you need to memorize only one arm. Humerus. Okay? Features that you should know about the humerus. So this part is called the head of the humerus. And you can clearly see two tubercles, greater and lesser tubercles, okay? An intertubercular groove. Those are sites of origin for multiple muscles of the arm. And then on the distal end here, you can see, first of all, this projection that I mentioned before this one. This is the medial condyle. Origin for flexors of your wrist and your fingers. But perhaps more important to understand is how, and it's probably not going to be accurate, but I have to use whatever I have. How humerus articulates with ulna. Okay? So, here I'm going to start with Benjamin. You can see that it forms a hinge joint, right? So let's take a look how this thing works. I think the, the old, no, 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 they're kind of the same, yeah. They're from the same left, left arm. So you see this surface here, the groovy surface. This is called trochlea. This it's called trochlear notch. Okay? Um, so trochlear and trochlear notch come together forming a joint. Does that make sense? These two, this is how you know that it's old. If you see a letter U, this is old. These two processes have their own names. So the one in the back, this one, it's called olecranon process. And when 
you bend your elbow, it goes into the olecranon fossa. The process in front is called coronoid process, and it goes into the coronoid fossa. The head of the ulna is distal. This is radius. Okay? Now the head of the radius right here articulates with a part of the humerus that is called a capitulum. So all three bones coming together form elbow joint. Now I promise the last thing for today is the hand and we're going to wrap it up because I can see you barely like the words are coming out of your ears right now like you are filled up to this good news um, five, 19, 19 bones in your hand are ridiculously simple to memorize this two on a thumb and three on each finger are phalanges. Are you following? This are proximal, this are distal, this four are medial. Makes perfect sense, right? So thumb has only two phalanges, proximal and distal. Every other finger has three. How do we know which one's which? One, two, three, four, five. So this is the fifth proximal phalanx. This is second medial phalanx. Easy. What about these five bones? These are metacarpals. Same way. One, two, three, four, five. Nothing too complicated. Okay. What we're going to learn now are carpals. I'm not going to lie to you. In my opinion, knowing eight carpals is the hardest task. Okay, you need to start at the proper place. You need to start in the proper order. So, if you look at the carpals, what I prefer to do, you always start. You kind of see there are two rows, the proximal and the distal. You always start at the proximal row. You always, so I'm talking about the left hand now, start at the proximal row, the one that um, articulates with radius and ulna, okay? and you always start from the lateral side, basically from the thumb. Okay? So, look at your models and try to find a bone that articulates with the radius, should articulate with the radius, right here, and it's shaped somewhat like a bean. So, in case of Miranda, it's going uh, to be under the thumb that is missing. Okay, so this bean-shaped bone is scaphoid. You start moving towards medial aspect and you go scaphoid, lunati, triquetrum, and the bone that kind of sticks out, which is pisiform. So you complete proximal row, you move on to the distal row, again to the thumb. So now you go trapezium, it articulates, trapezium articulates with the thumb directly. Then you go trapezoid, it articulates with your second metacarpal. Then you have capitati, and I'll say a few words about, so capitati is a pretty large carpal bone 
that articulates with a third metacarpal. And then you have hamati, which articulates with a fourth and a little bit with the fifth metacarpals. Now, if you look at capitati bone, the one that directly articulates with a third metacarpal, it looks a little bit like Darth Vader's head. Okay? So I'm going to go one more time now. What I'm going to do next, I'm going to come to you and we're just going to walk like together as a team. So, scaphoid, lunati, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitati, and hamati.